Order. The sitting is resumed, and it's time for questions to the Minister for Social Development. And those who weren't up all night counting votes will notice that it is the Minister of Finance who is standing in for his ministerial colleague who is unwell. Uh, could I also just inform members that question 11 has been withdrawn, and I call Ms. Katrina Ruan. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And I'd, um Question number one. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. The work of the Housing Repossession Task Force will be time bound and completed in two phases. The first phase will focus upon the nature and extent of the possessions issue in Northern Ireland with a view to producing an initial research report by the end of June 2014. Minister McCausland is pleased to advise that the task force is making strong progress in the completion of this research phase. Outcomes from this research will then inform the second phase of developing evidence-based recommendations for potential mitigating actions by the end of this year. And I call Ms. Ryan for supplementary. Um, and does the Minister accept that building or providing more social homes will prevent low-income families from being forced to buy properties? in the rented sector and thereby potentially spiralling into debt and that it's, it's more appropriate to be building uh, more social homes? Well, look, I, I mean, I, I suppose there's going to be a, a habitual problem throughout the course of the next 45 minutes and that I will be in uh, often cases expressing, expressing my view, which I'm sure will chime entirely, Mr Deputy Speaker, with that of the Minister for, for Social Development. And I think that the, the targets that are laid out in the uh, programme for government for social and affordable homes over the current programme for government period, which I think is around 8,000 uh, homes of the target which the, the Minister and his department are on, on, on track to, to make, is an ambitious but a, a very achievable target that will make a considerable difference to, to people in, in Northern Ireland. I, I mean, I do agree. I mean, clearly, quite clearly, and given the times that we are in, there are more people who are under pressure. Uh, and for them, social, social housing is the appropriate answer. It isn't the answer for everybody, and that's why I'm very pleased and have been very pleased over the last number of years that the, the Minister for Social Development has pursued not just more social homes but also more affordable homes as well. And uh, I'm very pleased that, uh, with the help of my own department, the Department of Finance and Personnel, the budget for co ownership housing in Northern Ireland has doubled over the last number of years. Um, last year alone, over 1,000. Uh, people were able to avail of the co-ownership housing scheme in Northern Ireland, and for those people, owning a home was the right option. I don't think that if you were to talk to over, over 1,000 uh, individuals and families who have availed of co-ownership in the last year, that they would think that they were stuck with that. That is a choice that they have made. It's a positive choice for them, uh, and a lot of the modelling that was taken uh, looked at in terms of what it was saving people in terms of a mortgage payment through mortgage and a, and a, a rent payment through uh, ownership was considerably less than what they were doing through uh, private rented. So for some people, social housing is obviously the answer, and for others, affordable housing is the answer uh, for them. And for others, it is buying homes with perhaps some some assistance as well from from government and from others. I call Mr. Jimmy Spratt. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, can I thank the Minister for his answers so far? Can I ask the Minister, uh, is he concerned that possible future uh, interest rate rises uh, may uh, result in increases in repossessions? I think the, the, the fear or the spectre of the, the inevitability of um, mortgage interest rates rising over the the next number of years, while it's been good for, for savers who have been uh, struggling in the last number of years because of the very low, the record low levels for such a long period of time uh, of interest rates, um, will have a opposite reaction for those who are um, on, on the property ladder or who are, are paying off their, their mortgages. And one only had to listen to the Governor of the Bank of England weekend before last uh, talking about uh, the housing market, obviously, the housing market in, in Great Britain, particularly in London and the South East, an entirely different position than where ours is. They're talking widespread talk about it overheating and a property bubble developing there. No such, uh, no such worries or concerns at this stage about that happening here in Northern Ireland. Very little heat uh, in the market, albeit changing over the last uh, number of months. Um, so, like, I think, I think there are concerns, uh, understandable concerns, that if there was to be a sudden increase in uh, interest rates that, that would put a lot of people under pressure. Um, I, I take some comfort from listening to the Governor of the Bank of England that he isn't looking at uh, sudden, or in, um, sudden increases in the interest rate and he isn't saying that it's going to happen very soon. It's going to happen, I think we all inevitably understand, at some stage in the future. 
Um, and I think it is important that, that those who are um, on the property ladder, who are paying their mortgages, do what uh, I heard described last week at a Bank of Ireland event, which was that just as the banks are themselves undergoing stress tests, um, that individuals and households themselves look at their, their household income in the context of possible interest rate rises and what that might mean for their own budget. So there are, um, there are obvious concerns there, and I think people need to be very cognizant of those uh, concerns and whenever those who are stepping onto the property ladder need to make sure that they can afford the houses that they are buying and that if there is a, a sudden jump in interest rates that they could still be able to afford to live in the houses that they have bought. I call Mr Byrne. I thank the Minister for his answers. Would the Minister accept that those unfortunate families that are living through a nightmare situation are being put through hell in relation to house repossessions and them having to be moved out, that this is an unacceptable situation, and what advice can the executive give to those people that are suffering the loss of their family home? I, I absolutely agree with the member that for those who find themselves in the unfortunate position where they have been unable to afford to keep up payments in their own house and they face the, the prospect, the very real prospect, and the reality in, in many instances where their, their, their family home, home for many years in many cases, uh, is taken off them. It's not a nice situation to be in. Uh, and that's why the executive, that's why the Minister for Social Development and his department have supported the, uh, um, the Housing Rights Service in providing support and assistance to those who are in that very situation. And all the evidence, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is that the quicker people get to the likes of the Housing Rights Service with their problems and sit down and try to work them through with not just the Housing Rights Service but also the, the mortgage lender as well, the more likelihood that there is a, that there will be a positive outcome to their problem. Uh, and I think that the, and I think we can all understand and appreciate this. People are perhaps reluctant sometimes to accept that they have a problem. They try to, uh, they try to ca carry on. They try to uh, muddle through. Um, but all the time, the pressure is building and building and building. And the message that I'm sure the minister, uh, if he was here, would, would, would send out to people is that. In, if you think you have problems, if you actually have problems in paying off your mortgage, engage and engage early, not just with your mortgage lender, but also with the likes of the Housing Rights Service, who are, are, are providing an exceptional service supported by the Department for Social Development. And in those circumstances, with that help, with that expert advice, there's always the chance that the very scenario that the member paints of somebody losing their family home might be avoided. I call Mr. Kinnahan for a supplementary. Thank you very much, um, Vice Principal Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer so far. Um, in my patch, Christians Against Poverty have been quite excellent in helping people out. But does the Minister accept that we really don't have enough support and debt relief out there to help people and to help groups like that? And that will the Minister put more effort into helping the Housing Repossession Task Force actually build better contacts and make sure everyone does know what exists and what's out there? I, I would echo what the, uh, Mr. Kinnan has said, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in respect of uh, the charity Christians Against Poverty, who have a presence in my own constituency as well. Uh, and um, they and, and many others, and some of the, uh, the more established names, like the Citizens Advice Bureau, I mentioned the Housing Rights Service before, they are all doing um, exceptional work. Uh, and obviously, the members highlighted in the issue is more about uh, repossessions and housing debt. Sometimes that is. Um, triggered by debt issues in other parts of people's lives, um, which has a knock-on effect into the inability to pay their, uh, an individual to pay their mortgage. So you know, I, I suppose in that sense, a more um, overarching approach is, is, is useful. Um, and I do know that um, in response to, to the crisis over the last number of years, not only has the Department for Social Development helped to fund uh, the Housing Rights Service, but also uh, my colleague, the Enterprise Minister, has, through personal debt, helped uh, um, fund the likes of the Citizen Advice Bureau to carry out some work on, on her department's behalf. So there is lots of work going on. I am sure that um, in response to the member's question, we could um, get a, 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 a more fulsome response to him in terms of what is being done to knit together um, those different but uh, sometimes interrelated parts of, of, of the debt problem. Thank you. And I call Mr David Michael Veen. Mr Deputy Speaker, with, uh, with your permission, I will answer questions two and eight together as each raise similar issues. The Building Successful Communities Programme, which the Department for Social Development launched in October of 2013, springs directly from the vision of housing-led community regeneration outlined within DSD's housing strategy. This vision is focused on ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to access 
uh, good quality housing at a reasonable cost. It recognises the significant role housing can play in helping support and sustain economic recovery, create employment and help regenerate some of our most deprived and neglected communities. The six pilot areas which have been chosen, five in Belfast and one in Palomina, were chosen as they represent some or all of the problems building successful communities is specifically designed to address blight, vacant housing stock, antisocial behaviour, high incidences of reported crime and economic inactivity. Obviously, Mr. Speaker, or Deputy Speaker, these areas are very different from one another, uh, and some of the specific challenges are unique to that area. The Building Successful Communities Programme, therefore, cannot and will not try to implement the one-size-fits-all solution in each of the pilot areas. That is why Minister McCausland is delighted to report that three of the six pilot areas have already established their regeneration fora. Work is now underway in these three areas to identify that area's specific physical, social, environmental and economic needs, with a view to developing a plan to address these needs. The regeneration fora in the remaining three pilot areas are expected to meet soon. Minister McCausland knows the members will be uh, particularly interested in an update on the pilot in and Dowry Road in I hope I've pronounced that correct in Balamina. The Dowry Road building successful communities forum met for the first time on the first of May and a second meeting is planned for the twenty seventh of May. A Building Successful Communities seminar is plan also planned to take place at the 174 Trust on the Antrim Road, itself a magnificent example of the transformative power of regeneration uh, on Wednesday, the 11th of June. Targeted at members of the Regeneration Fora, the seminar will draw speakers from across the regeneration field who will impart their experience, encouragement, and suggestions for the challenges ahead. Can I remind the uh, Minister about the two minute rule and Mr. McLevine for a supplement? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the Minister for his answer. And I am delighted uh, that he did make mention of the Dury Road, and I will pr pr correct his pronunciation slightly on that. Um, but the Minister um, made mention of, of that particular scheme. It is my understanding that the Housing Executive are intended to put the demolition um, part of this scheme on hold. Um, does that mean curtains for the demolition, or do the Housing Executive plan at a later stage to, uh, to demolish the vacant properties? Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, with respect to the, the, the Dury Road, is it Dury? It must be the Balamina uh, pronunciation of that. It is my understanding, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that the, uh, the Housing Executive's demolition plans, which the member has mentioned, preceded the decision to pilot the Building Successful Communities Programme in, in that area. In light of the establishment of the Dury Road as a pilot area, Minister McCausland has agreed with the Housing Executive that it would not be appropriate to progress current demolition plans. All plans for regeneration of the estate, including any necessary demolitions, will be subject to be taken forward uh, uh, through the plan developed by the Building Successful Communities Forum in Dury Road. The forum includes Helm and Triangle Housing Associations, who have been appointed to progress all new social and affordable housing developments within that pilot area. Good. And Ms. Pam Cameron for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Uh, can the Minister confirm how long the Building Successful Communities Programme will run for? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank the member for a question. Uh, stage one of the programme, which covered the setup of the programme and its staff and governance arrangements, as well as the establishment of the forums, is now in its concluding stages. In the next month, the programme will move into stage two, which will cover the beginning of the production of action plans and the appointment of consultants to work with each forum and provide expertise and support in the formulation of action plans. The Department for Social Development anticipates that stage two will be completed for all six pilot areas by July of 2015. Stage 3, which will run until the end of 2015, will deal with the approval of the action plans, quality screening related to the actions contained within these action plans, and of course the securing of funding from the Minister of Finance and Personnel. And I would say to the Minister of Social Development, good luck with that. And call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Can I thank the Minister and can the Minister reassure the House that the Building Successful Communities pilot uh, will comply with the relevant equality legislation? I mean, as I mentioned in response to the uh, previous member, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, ensuring uh, doing the equality screening, as would be done with, with any uh, policy, is, is a part of building successful communities programme. It will be done at, at stage three, which will uh, run to the end of, of, of 2015, so uh, to the end of next year, and that will deal with a whole range of issues, including, as I mentioned, funding and also 
uh, quality screening relating to the specific actions related to the uh, action plans which are developed by the four in each area. And I call Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister mentions the Dury Road. I just wonder if he's aware that over 20 families have been given notice to quit there uh, as part of this uh, uh, development. It's not really conducive to uh, a good project. Do you agree? I, I obviously don't. I'm sure the member, member knows that uh, I wouldn't have uh, that level of intimate uh, detail in respect of why or what are the particular circumstances around surrounding notices to quit and um, what I will certainly do is I'll ensure that officials from the Department for Social Development contact the, the member with the, an answer and an explanation as to why that is the case. Thank you and I call Mr Kieran McCarthy. Question number three to the Minister. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. Minister McCausland has a responsibility for ensuring that access to housing is available for all citizens irrespective of their religious or political persuasion and has publicly and consistently highlighted the need to build more homes and improve housing conditions for everyone in Northern Ireland. The Housing Executive has a statutory duty to regularly examine housing conditions and, and need. In doing so, it frequently commissions independent research to inform its approach. This reflects the Housing Executive's Northern Ireland-wide remit and its long track record of determining housing need, identifying where new housing should be located, and allocating housing on the basis of identified need. Call Mr. McCarthy for a supplementary. The Minister will be aware of the considerable concern um, about the uh, Department building houses in this area and could question the political um, benefits by the Minister. Um, rather than providing homes for people in greatest need, can the Minister tell the Assembly how, how he can restore public confidence um, in the process, and particularly for the people in North Belfast? You know, the, the issue of you know, identifying need is, I mean, the, question, the original question for the member asked about ensuring that there was independent advice, and I can ensure the member and I can ensure the House on behalf of the Minister for Social Development that the models and the statistics that are produced to identify need are independently assessed and, and reviewed. Uh, in respect of his, his concerns, which he has respect, which is reflecting the concerns expressed by others, uh, it is, of course, coming from one particular perspective and doesn't bear in mind the, the, the wider social need and indeed deep social housing need that there is right across uh, North Belfast. And whenever one looks at the, um, the whole of the North Belfast constituency, um, there is an identified housing need that shows that there are 1,994 members of the who are deemed as members of the Protestant community or identify themselves as such, and 1,988 who identify themselves as Roman Catholic who are on the waiting list in the North Belfast constituency. So far from, and I'm sure the member is too, he's too long on the tooth to uh, fall for the hype and the propaganda of others, I'm sure that he would appreciate that 1,994 versus 1,988 doesn't show that there is need predominantly on one side of the community versus the other, but in fact that there is balance in terms of the need and very high housing need that there is in that constituency. I call Mr Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers today. Can the Minister clarify what independent advice that the Housing Executive receives in calculating housing need across Northern Ireland? And is it just assessed against waiting lists? No, it, it, it isn't. And, and, you know, the, the member is right to ask the, the questions, indeed, the, the, is the, Mr McCarthy asked in respect of independent advice. This isn't just the minister sitting down and working this out himself. This isn't even the housing executive or his department doing this. This is work that has um, had external independent underpinning uh, by people who are experts in the field. So the most, for example, the most recent calculation Deputy Speaker, um, of housing need and looking across the whole of Northern Ireland, not just in, in North Belfast, was done in January of 2013, so just, just over a year ago. And that work was carried out by, by Chris Paris, who is, uh, or was an emeritus uh, professor of the University of Ulster. He's now at the University of Adelaide. Uh, professor Paris calculated that 1,200 new social homes per year are required across the 2018 period to meet estimated demand. So, you know, that, that is work that is, as I say, not done by the Minister, not done by the Department, uh, not done by the Housing Executive, but done and assisted by an independent academic from, at that stage, the University of Ulster. 
So, you know, whenever some people are throw, hurling around various accusations in the direction of the Minister for Social Development, what they're actually doing is undermining the work of an academic from the University of Ulster. I call Mr. Dominic Bradley. Um, could I ask the Minister, does he now concede that the use of the figures uh, regarding housing need in North Belfast was uh, disingenuous, uh, referring as they did to the parliamentary constituency rather than the housing district? And can he outline what actions are being put, a, put in place to address the, pl the plight of those who are in housing need within that district? Well, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the, the member wouldn't wish to, you know, start to parcel up artificially need. You know, need is need. A need across the whole of the North Belfast constituency has been identified, as I, as I outlined in response to Mr. McCarthy, as being not predominantly need in one community, but actually pretty equal need across both communities. And, you know, to identify that in you can identify that in district offices, and of course there is a North Belfast. There is an office called the North Belfast Housing Executive Office, which doesn't cover the entirety of North Belfast. So to ask about North Belfast and to get a North Belfast answer does not, in any way, cover the entirety, even close to the entirety, of the North Belfast constituency. And I think it is it is it is useful, it is right, it is proper that the minister provides figures on a constituency by constituency basis. I know within my own department you are frequently asked for statistics on a constituency by constituency basis. It is not always easy because that is not sometimes how, it's, how figures on statistics are actually uh, produced. But you know, I think in a situation where the North Belfast District Office covers roughly a quarter with Newton Abbey 1 and 2 and also Shankill covering that, that area, I think it is only right and proper that that broader perspective of need right across the constituency and considerable need right across the constituency, considerable need in the Protestant community, every bit as much as there is within the Catholic community in North Belfast. I, mean, I can see members opposite shaking their head. As, and and, and the, the, truth, and, and the, the truth, I think, of what is happening across the way is that they, they, want to, they want to wallow in the need of one community and not have any regard for the need of other communities over a line. There is need, there is serious housing need in the North Belfast Order. constituency, in the Protestant community, every bit as much as there is, indeed more so than there is in the nationalist community. That is a need that the members opposite clearly wish to ignore, but it is not a need that the, mem minutes, the Minister for Social Devel Development is going to ignore. I call Mr. Alec Maskey. Yes, Mr. Cahar. Brief last question, question number four, please. No. Mr. Maskey, um, could I uh, uh, acknowledge that response from the minister on behalf of the other minister? Um, can I make the point that uh, I mean, obviously, it kind of follows on from the last discussion, and it is, I think, very, very unfortunate that this issue of housing has now become seriously politicised and sectarianised in respect of North Belfast. And I would put it to the minister on behalf of his ministerial colleague that, in a recent interview, the the, the minister in question stated that one of the Recently, nine houses allocated in Old Park or in North Belfast had been allocated to an applicant with 200 points. But on the basis that over, I think, over half of the nine properties allocated were allocated to people with no points, does the minister not accept, on behalf of his ministerial colleagues, that makes completely a mockery of the notion and concept of objective need? I'm afraid, Mr. Deputy Speaker, without. Uh, specific knowledge of the particular nine houses, where they are, who got them, what points they got them on, and all of that. I, I'm not in a position to give the member the sort of answer that he, uh, he was obviously looking for. I call Mr. Sammy Wilson. Does the minister like me find it amaz amazing the bare-faced hypocrisy of Sinn Féin, who, on one hand, call for the, uh, the, the resignation of a minister who has allocated resources? for housing on a, a pattern which does not suit their sectarian prejudices, while at the same time ignores their own leader who has been implicated in covering up the rape of a young girl. And their, the deputy, the, their, uh, the deputy um, minister in this, uh, first minister in this assembly, who has now been implicated in murder by one of his own terrorist colleagues um, in Londonderry. And will he give us an assurance 
that the minister will not bow to the pressure of Sinn Féin and that my constituents, some of whom are in North Belfast, will not be disadvantaged by spurious, prejudiced and biased reports which are politically motivated and designed to take resources away from the Protestant community. I have to remind members that question time is meant to be about the topic under discussion. It's not an opportunity for speeches, and I do think the member who just spoke, former minister, is well enough aware of that protocol. And it's out of order. Mr. Deputy Speaker, DSD questions are a lot livelier than DFD, DFP questions. I, 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 I might come back in future. Um, I, I agree entirely with uh, everything that the member has said, and that how there is a lots of there's cat calling and howling from the benches opposite for resignations or standing aside for ministers on this side of the House when what they are doing is doing their job, and that is trying their best to address housing need in Northern Ireland wherever that arises, whether that's in Catholic communities in North Belfast, whether that's in Protestant communities in North Belfast, or whatever community across Northern Ireland that is located. Um, the, North Belf um, the situation in North Belfast, which is, has been, uh, there have been attempts to mask this down through the years that there were problems on the Protestant community side of things in North Belfast, have been shown to be very real by the work of the Minister for Social Development. He, of course, met frequently with the, uh, the, the MP for that area uh, to address these housing issues. Um, it is not the Minister for Social Development's fault that the DUP MP for North Belfast is incredibly active on this issue. He, of course, has received no requests from Sinn Féin or the SDLP to meet to discuss any housing issues in that area. Um, so there are some Johnny come lately to this issue who are now crying and gurning and complaining about it whenever uh, the minister has been doing his best to address that housing need in both sides of the community in North Belfast and indeed elsewhere. Call Mr. Alvin McGuinness. Very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Isn't it clear from uh, the online uh, newspaper, the detail, uh, that uh, Minister McCausland was intent in not uh, simply meeting uh, with uh, the chairperson of the housing executive, but meeting with officials of the housing executive at a local level in order to browbeat them and bully them into a political stance uh, which uh, suited his political agenda, instead of addressing the needs of the 300 are the 3,888 people who require houses in North Belfast. To Mr Deputy Speaker, to accuse the Minister of browbeating officials uh, from the, Depart uh, from the Housing Executive is a very, 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 very serious ac accusation, but I would expect nothing less from from members, and particularly the member for North Belfast from the SDLP, who, of course, whenever they were in the, uh, the Department for Social Development, removed the ring fence for uh, housing provision, which included North Belfast. So, you know, if there is any, you know, if there's, if there's accusations about neglecting need in North Belfast, perhaps the member should look much closer uh, to his own party. Um, the uh, reading that the member has of the uh, the article in, you, in the online newspaper, the detail is distinctly different from my reading of it and what it says, and there is no accusation of, of gerrymandering or browbeating that is made by that newspaper. And I think the member should be incredibly careful about what he accuses the Minister for Social Development of. Well, Mr. Michael Copeland. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and could I ask the Minister on behalf of, of his ministerial colleague if he could give a commitment that the seemingly endless and partisan spat between himself and those opposite will not in any way impact at all on the eventual delivery of much-needed housing at Girdwood. Yeah, and, and, well, Girdwood is obviously only one, one part of, of North Belfast, and, and um, obviously there, uh, there's social housing, new social housing earmarked for that site. Um, but you know, I, think the, I think the member is actually getting towards the right point. I think there is, you know, the. The accusations that are being thrown by, by Sinn Féin and by the SDLP uh, are an attempt to throw up, as Mr Wilson said, a smokescreen. And I can assure the member and, um, that the, the Minister for Social Development will not be um, knocked off course in terms of addressing uh, the, the core of this issue, which is that the North Belfast constituency has a very high social housing need, which is represented on both sides of the community. That is his job to address that, and he, I'm sure, will endeavour to do the best that he can to address that need. And that uh, ends the period for oral questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call Mr. Leslie Cree.
Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and on behalf of his colleague, I would ask the Minister um, what action has been taken uh, to improve the work capability assessments following the review of the Employment Support Alliance? Well, I'm not, I'm not, um, not familiar um, with the specific details of what has been done in that respect, and I would like at like, the, the risk of repeating my last answer to the member, I will provide that information. What will now be, a, I'm sure, a very lengthy letter back to, the, to Mr. Cree. We try for a hat trick. I call Mr. Cree for supplementary. Yes, indeed, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, it will be a hat trick. Uh, part, part of the process involved the use of men, mental health champions, uh, and I would ask the minister how many of those mental health champions there are and what is the procedure for appointing these people to specific cases at appeal? Mr. Speaker, I've always wanted to do this. I refer the member to the answer I gave some moments ago. <laughs> On Ms. Pam Cameron. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister if he recognises that there is a general lack of understanding in the public regarding welfare reform and about how it's going to affect the public? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I I think there's hardly a member of the, the public who could have escaped over the last, particularly over the last number of weeks and months, that there is a, a, a debate going on about welfare reform and how that affects people in Northern Ireland. But you know, I, I, as a sometimes participant in that debate, I think I would be perhaps one of the first to accept that from time to time that debate has generated much more heat than it has light. Um, and I think that whilst that heat has been kicked up. Um, Perhaps some of the realities of welfare reform in Northern Ireland have been missed by uh, a great many people of, of, uh, within Northern Ireland, particularly those who might feel that they are being affected in one way, but maybe in reality aren't being affected. And that will, of course, I'm sure, cause considerable concern, perhaps some unwarranted concern for people. And I think um, I know that my, my colleague, the Minister for Social Development, was very keen to um, inform and better inform members of the general public through a a, a, um, a sort of a information campaign. I think the Committee on, for Social Development unfortunately took a somewhat different view as to the merits of that. I think that's regrettable. I think that anything which better informs the general public about anything that we do here, Mr. Deputy Speaker, but particularly an issue uh, like welfare reform, which is um, detailed and difficult for even members of this House to get their head around, um, but especially for those who feel that they may be affected perhaps aren't going to be affected or maybe aren't going to be affected as much, I think would be something that would be very worthwhile. Well, Mrs Cameron, for a supplementary. Uh, thank the Minister for his answer and given his response, how urgent does the Minister believe a resolution to welfare reform um, here in Northern Ireland is? Uh, I, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think that, you know, whilst notwithstanding the points I made in, in, in my previous answer, um, you know, and I think that there is, there is a need for us to accept that um, there is an urgent need, in fact, for us to accept that if we do not get on with dealing with welfare reform, that the ramifications for Northern Ireland are going to be incredibly severe. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have received correspondence from the Chief Secretary of the Treasury uh, in the last week, in which he has confirmed and has taken off £13 million already from our baseline as an executive to spend in this year. So that money is now gone. So there is no debate, Mr. Deputy Speaker, any longer about this being paper money, this not being a real process, this not happening. The money has now gone from our baseline. And the people of Northern Ireland, including vulnerable people who are availing of services from the Health Service, uh, from the Education Department, and indeed from the Social Development Department as well, are now going to suffer as a result of a lack of £13 million to spend. And there is, of course, the looming threat of a further £87 million to be taken off later in the year if progress is not made in respect of welfare reform in Northern Ireland. And, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I know that there are many members of this House who are not fans of the proposed welfare reform. There are many members of my own party who are not fans uh, of elements of the welfare reform agenda as well, and we have opposed them and rightly opposed them in Westminster where they should be opposed. But the reality is now that non-progress on the basis, I have to say, of a package which is incredibly attractive versus what people in England and Scotland and Wales have at their disposal, I think not to move forward on it now when time is of the urgency, uh, ur time is of a critical uh, nature, um, is letting down the people of Northern Ireland and is an abject failure in leadership on the part 
of some within this house. Call Mr. Sean Rogers. Principal Deputy Speaker, does the Minister agree that the alleged overpayment of the 18 million the assessment of that was a way off the mark? No. Mr. Rogers, for supplementary. Well, does the Minister agree that the reputational damage done to those contractors as a result of that, what is the Minister going to do about that? Well, you know, I, the, reason, the reason for my rather short answer previously was that we. Um, there is work, and the member will know that there is work ongoing in respect of the uh, alleged overpayments of £18 million to a range of, I think, four contractors in Northern Ireland. That work is being carried out by the housing executive, who obviously were the, the organisation that had the contracts with the contractors. That, um, that work, that piece of investigative work, hasn't come to the Department for Social Development yet. And I am therefore, on behalf of the Minister, not able to comment at this stage. Ms. Megan Farron is not in her place. I call Mr. Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, sir. Can the Minister give any indication of what is the future for the neighbourhood renewal schemes that have been so beneficial for many parts of the cities and uh, district towns? Uh, sir. Deputy Speaker, and perhaps a, an apt time to be raising it in the week after uh, local government elections to our new uh, reorganised councils and our 11 councils. As my understanding, as a member, I'm sure will appreciate that the uh, powers and in regeneration, including um, powers for neighbourhood renewal, are to move to the new councils uh, as of the 1st of April of next year. I welcome the, the Minister's statement on that, but can the Minister give any indication will there be any finance allocated to the new councillors to maybe widen the scope and remit of the neighbourhood renewable schemes, particularly in relation to smaller towns? Well, the, the member will, I'm sure, Mr Deputy Speaker, be well aware, particularly given the uh, stewardship of the Department of the Environment by his party colleague, Mr Durkin, that the, one of the overarching principles of the review of public administration is that no um, power should, or no service should transfer from central government, from Stormont, to local government in a way that would cost uh, local government. And there is detailed work going on um, between actually the Department of the Environment and my own department uh, to work out the exact intricacies of that funding mechanism for uh, various services moving forward. Um, so it will be done in a, but I mean the principle of it being done in a, in a cost neutral way uh, is important. Um, there will be obviously discussions to be had at each individual departmental level as to how that is done and the Department of Social Development will have a view as to how that should be done and other departments might have slightly different views on that. Um, and I know there are some discussions in respect of that and I have in fact met with the, Department, uh, the Minister of the Environment to discuss a particular issue around um, some powers transferring from DSD to, to local government. Um, but of course moving forward in terms of additional money that then starts to become, Mr Deputy Speaker, the responsible responsibility of each individual new council, uh, and it will be for them, within the, uh, the powers that they have, within the borrowing powers, within the rate bases that they have, to choose what their own priorities are, and if new council areas want to spend more on, for example, neighbourhood renewal, that's a matter for them. That's what the essence of being in government, whether it be local or central government, is all about. It's about making choices, and just as we would have to make a choice if we wanted to move funding from neighbourhood renewal or from something to neighbourhood renewal and the consequences of less spending elsewhere, so too local government will face those uh, realities in the years to come. Well, Mr. Pat Sheehan. I've got a free last count, Corla. Uh, I understand the DSD minister had some misfortune, re misfortune recently and uh, in spite of the controversy earlier on here today, I'd like to send my best wishes for a speedy recovery to him. Uh, and just could I ask the Minister uh, to provide an update on the, uh, the DLO Performance and Development Committee that uh, was recently advertised for by the Department Stroke Housing Executive? I'm sure Mr Deputy Speaker, the Minister is grateful for the member's uh, best wishes. Um, in respect of an update, um, rather than give the Member, something completely inaccurate, I will ensure that the Department communicates with them and gives them a, a detailed response. Mr Sheehan, for a supplementary. And I'm just wondering, uh, could the Minister, when he's doing that, uh, provide details of how many people actually applied for those positions? 
Deputy Speaker, I'm sure that the department will have heard that and will have ensured that, ensured that the member gets uh, as full a response as, he, uh, as, he can, as we can provide. And I call Mr. David Hildreth. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And further to Mr. Burns' question, could the minister outline what new responsibilities super councils will deliver instead of the department? Yeah, I think neighbourhood in is just one of the, the, the powers that will transfer from, from the Department of Social Development to, um, uh, to local government. Re the powers of regeneration, um, including regeneration of, of sites such as, for example, um, uh, Queen's Parade in, in Bangor and in, in the new North Down and Ours Council area, of which I'm a, uh, now a rate pair. Uh, we'll now be funding the redevelopment of, the, of that such a development. In, in Bangor, and Mr. Gordon Dunn was very appreciative of those rates heading up the dual carriageway into, into Bangor. Um, and these are these are powers, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that I'm, I'm quite um, quite excited about councils getting. Uh, I'm sure the member too, in, in his uh, his constituency, um, will see the potential for places like Carrick and Larn uh, to not to wait as they have in the past, perhaps for the prioritisation by the Department for Social Development. That's not to, to knock what has been happening in the past. It's just a reality of having a certain amount of money at our disposal to spend on regeneration projects in certain areas will get prioritised and others will have to wait, wait their turn. Um, it is now up to, as I said in response to Mr Byrne, up to the new councils as they settled in and develop plans for their areas to say this is what we want to prioritise our, our expenditure on. Uh, and I'm very excited about the possibility of many schemes that perhaps have been, perhaps have been sitting on the shelves for a number of years actually being fast-forwarded and, and developed in, in pretty quick order. For supplementary. You, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for the answer. Uh, does the Department have the confidence in the new councils that they'll be able to deliver these essential functions uh, once they take over? I, I think for, certainly in terms of, of, of elected members, I think there will be a... Um, Bit of a culture shock for some um, in terms of their um, grasping very quickly, and they need to grasp very quickly because responsibility begins on the 1st of April of next year. Uh, and and councillors, whilst they still have to do everything that they did before and have to ensure that that is done to a, a very high standard, there are a lot of powers planning, community planning, and so forth, including and, and regeneration as well, which are going to come and they're going to have to, to get their heads around uh, almost immediately. Uh, I do have, I mean, I have, um, I think that. Uh, there are good teams of councillors who have been elected right across the country to serve their, their new district council areas. I think that what they all have got to collectively realise is that they have an opportunity to shape their areas and their new council areas in a way that those of us who have been in local government in the past would have had no opportunity to do and would have been actually quite envious in some ways of the powers that are now being bestowed on local government to reshape, to regenerate uh, their towns, their cities and their, and their villages. Um, so I think it's as, it is... It, for me, I think the biggest challenge is not the capability of officials or not even the capability of um, members of councils. I think it's just their, their ability to see the big picture in this. And I think that all of our new councils and all of our new councillors need to begin to very quickly embrace the possibilities and the opportunities that the Review of Public Administration presents to them. You yeah, um, call Mr. Dominic Bradley. Boilums a a ifri dinara kajen vas at a again o kajimra vas and che and reactinus ti he after a canter in your ogus war. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. I, I would like to ask the Minister for his uh, estimation of the current housing need in the Nurian Morn housing district. Deputy Speaker, I don't have those figures to hand. Mr. Bradley, for supplement. Thank the, the Minister for his answer, short and all as it was. But could I ask the Minister if he will, uh, in due course, provide up to date um, figures and also outline how that need has been addressed? Thank you. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm, I'm very pleased to give the member the assurance that I will, uh, I will ensure that that information is provided to him. And order uh, that ends the time and well done.